I hope you've had an opportunity to watch the PBS special, Cancer, the Emperor of All Maladies on NET. Both the book and the film show that we have made remarkable progress in understanding the complexities of cancer. Next, we'll introduce you to some remarkable Nebraskans living with cancer. I took that to mean my cancer was terminal, that it had, it had spread throughout my body. It was too late. I was totally devastated, and um, it was very hard to think about anything except cancer and death and dying and missing out on everything. As bad of a journey as it's been, there have been phenomenal people walking with me. The greatest hope out of all of this would be to see a world cancer-free in the next generation. Welcome, I'm Dennis Kellogg, and joining us in our discussion is Dr. Ken Cowan, the director of the Epley Institute and the director of the Fred and Pamela Buffett Cancer Center, and Dr. Sarah Thayer, who is a cancer specialist and physician-in-chief of the Buffett Cancer Center at UNMC in Omaha. Later, we'll be joined by Andy Hoffman and UNMC's Dr. Renesa Anthony. We'll also introduce you to a few amazing Nebraskans living with cancer. Well, welcome to both of you, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you're both on the ground level at Cancer Research in Nebraska, and it seems we've made progress in fighting cancer over the last hundred years or so, but cancer claimed more than 3,400 lo Nebraska lives in 2011, which is the last year available for, for stats. So we begin with a very simple question, and yet also probably a very difficult question. Dr. Cowan, I'll start with you. Are we winning the war on cancer? We're certainly making a lot of progress. If you referred to the last hundred years, but there's been a series, as, as was outlined in, in the book and uh, in, in the series, there have been a number of, of, of developments over the last 50 years, and specifically in developing new therapies. But even in the last 20 years, there's been continued to an improvement in both early detection, uh, identifying patients earlier, improvements in uh, detection, treatments, prevention, that have actually made it things a lot better even for cancer patients today. Dr. Thayer, what are the most common types of cancer that we see in Nebraska, and also what are the most deadliest types of cancer that we see in Nebraska? Well, some of the most common cancers that we see are lung cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, and colon cancer. Certainly those, uh, there are a significant number of those, but the deadly ones are really, if you think about it, is gonna be lung cancer first, colon cancer second, and believe it or not, pancreas in Nebraska is third and breast and prostate take the fourth position, which is slightly different from the nation. Uh, the nation basically looks at pancreatic cancer being the fourth leading cause of, of death of cancer, but in Nebraska, it's the third. So there's cancer research going on right here in Nebraska to fight some of those types of cancers. Let's talk about that. Give us an overview of what type of research is going on here in our state. Well, there's a broad breadth of uh, research in a variety of the diseases you just spoke about. Um, pancreatic cancer is actually one of the strengths uh, at uh, UNMC, as well as lymphoma and bone marrow transplantation, two of the areas we've uh, been very strong at uh, at the university. So we've had uh, researchers d uh, in these areas going back 20 or 30 years now, developing teams and continue to expand their efforts. Um, pancreatic cancer, again, Dr. Thayer just joined a group uh, last year, again, a, a very major addition to our pancreatic cancer, both care team as well as research teams that are looking at early detection, trying to decide, determine whether there's biomarkers that could actually detect pancreatic cancer earlier, ways of treating it, et cetera. And our bone marrow transplant program started back at UNMC back in 1982. has been one of the largest um, bone marrow transplant programs in the country, and um, it's really been a, a major program for the university for, for, for over 30 years now. And Dr. Thayer, what are the biggest obstacles that we face to making even more progress in this research against cancer? Well, the two that we can't really control that much about, uh, which is time and money. So we need a lot of, of time with uh, really good researchers exploring different possibilities. Now, remember research is broken down into multiple different facets. For example, 
You, we have basic science researchers which really look at some of the cornerstones, the initiators of this cancer, what drives the formation of a cancer cell, what drives the formation of its behavior, because cancer is not cancer is not cancer. Remember, cancer has, you, we have very many different types of cancer, but even within a cancer type, the behavior, the biology of that tumor is extraordinarily different. So we not only need to find out within multiple cancer types what causes these cancers, what might promote its growth, and why it has these behaviors, why some can be cured, why some can't. So those cornerstone discoveries really occur in the laboratory, and we need a huge number of basic science researchers with good foundational labs that are well-funded in order to address some of these, these underlying questions. Then the second phase of research is to translate some of these, these early discoveries and see if any of them have any possibility of being used in the clinics. Yeah. And then ultimately, the clinical researchers basically take this idea and say, hey, by the way, can we use that as a target? Can we use it as a predictive or a prognostic marker? Meaning, does it predict which, is it a good behaving tumor? Is it a bad behaving tumor? Mm -hmm. uh, does it predict who will respond to certain treatments? Can we design a more effective treatment for that person by looking at these? Yeah. And so you can see that the spectrum of education is extraordinary. It goes from the basic science lab to the translational researchers to the clinical researchers and then ultimately will hopefully change the lives for our patients. Well, absolutely. And when a patient hears that word, who gets that diagnosis, hears the word cancer, it can be devastating. How one man rose above the initial diagnosis is truly inspiring. That night, I planned my suicide. I was going to go to a nice hotel and take my shotgun, broken down in a suitcase, and end it there. That was John McAlpin's reaction upon hearing that he had cancer. I just uh, decided I wasn't going to die that kind of death. Just one day after having a tumor in his small intestine removed, the surgeon told McAlpin that though the surgery was successful, they had found cancer in his lymph nodes. I took that to mean my cancer was terminal, that it had, it had spread throughout my body. The next day, John was visited by Dr. David Silverberg, an oncologist. He said, so Mr. McAlpin, tell me about your cancer. And I told him I knew it was terminal. He said, who told you your cancer's terminal? I said, no one had to, I, I just know. He said, Mr. McAlpin, I will make a deal with you. If you promise to maintain a positive attitude, and it's vital that you do, I will give you your life back. And instantly I did a 180. John immediately started treatment at Methodist Estabrook Cancer Center. I didn't know what to expect. I, I guess I expected death and dying. Last thing in the world I expected was Barnum and Bailey in the form of Joyce and Ethel, the two greeters. And Ethel had me laughing before I got to the front desk, and Joyce is just f so full of love and hugs. And what are you, how are you doing? Loving. I began to realize I'm not walking into death and dying. I'm, I'm coming into a new family here. John had a CAT scan at the end of six months. He was cancer free, but the good news would be short lived. Six months later, he found two tumors. John endured hard chemo and several rounds of radiation. In the midst of his treatment, he found out that Ethel was retiring from her job at the front door. I told my wife I'm going to apply for that position. And she thought I was nuts. She said, you're 61 years old, you have terminal cancer. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm 61, I've got terminal cancer, I'm perfect for it. John got the job, and through radiation and chemo, he stood at the door of Estabrook. Hi, hi, how are we doing today? Welcoming weary patients. You need help finding where you're going? <laughs> every day. Right, Access Center. Access Center, yes. okay. For four hours a day. During the, uh, the worst days, the hardest days, I had a button made 
and I wore it on my smock every day. It says, my cancer is terminal. I'm not. Hello, ladies. How are we doing? Good. How are you? Doing good. Yep. You know, most people go through their life, they never find their calling. Oh, good to see you again. Good to see you, too. They do a job. They raise a family. They have grandkids. Sir, can I take the wheelchair for you? No, I need it. No, I mean, can I push it? Too? Oh, push it. Okay. No, I, I push her around all the You push her around yeah. all the time. OK. Hey. They never really find what they were born for. This is my last visit for three months, so okay. I won't see you for a while. I found it. Well. <laughs> I know exactly what I was born for. I, maybe I'll see you for a six month checkup. Or yes, something. okay. So, I'll walk you out. All right. I'm doing it. Yeah. Mary, is it okay if I pray for you? You bet. Okay. That yeah. would be great. Wouldn't it? Lord, we just lift Mary up. This isn't a job, this is a ministry. Thank you very much. You betcha. That was very nice. Bye bye. You know, I wouldn't trade my life with anybody. What a great attitude. So when a patient gets that initial diagnosis, they hear the C word, they hear the word cancer, there's obviously going to be anger, there's probably gonna be depression. As a doctor, what can you tell the patient in order to make that state of depression don't, that it doesn't extend on forever? Right, I think one of the key things is to take away their fear. Many of them come in with exactly that same fear. They're terminal, there's no treatment, this is a death sentence. And for the far majority, this is not their outcome. And so what we need to do is be able to speak to them in terms of where they are in their cancer, what stage they are, what treatments we have to offer, and what success we have in that cancer. So to quickly get information to that patient so that he can decipher what's real from what he believes is real. So that's the most important initial thing. That day when they hear that word is actually um, the most difficult day in their life. It changes their life forever. But as Dr. Thayer pointed out, um, many people, most people today, do survive that disease. Um, there's over 14 million Americans alive today as cancer survivors. That's four, more than four times the number alive in 1971. So there's been tremendous progress in diagnosing the disease, these diseases earlier, and treatments are far more effective. So many more people are surviving this disease and going on to lead a life. And what I tell patients every day is that you'll, you'll get beyond this. We can understand w what your disease is. We can understand how to treat it. We can understand making you understand that, that you're going to uh, survive this disease. But it will change your life forever, just like in that in video. Mm -hmm. It changes mm -hmm. your life forever. You will forever be different. You'll be a better person. You'll be a better father. You'll be a better uh, husband. You'll be a better everything to everybody. It does change your life forever. You'll look at life differently than everybody else. Absolutely. And so many people are diagnosed yeah. with it. Everybody's, everybody in their family is touched by cancer. Yeah. Well, having hope of recovery is a powerful motivator. So next we'll visit a Nebraskan who is finding a creative way to cope with the deadliest of cancers. Jeff Schmall was the vision behind Husker Vision. Jeff originated Husker Vision and created the goosebump moment known as the Husker Tunnel Walk. He was busy working in athletics and media until this latest shock. Now at age 58, Jeff Schmall is living with stage four pancreatic cancer. It did come as a very, very big shock. Um, I mean, I had, I had had a pain in my side for probably about a month. Um, I thought it might be an ulcer. I thought it might be a gallbladder. I, you know, you really don't think you've got cancer or anything big like that. And, the, and then to find out that not only is it cancer, but it's the worst kind of cancer that you can have, which is pancreatic cancer. It's a very slow growing cancer in your pancreas. But once it spreads, then that's when it turns deadly very, very quickly. Once I started chemotherapy, my numbers started to get good. And so I had reason to be optimistic that the chemotherapy was working and that I had a chance to get better. And the type of cancer that I have, literally only 2% of people make it five years. Really for pancreatic cancer right now, there are no cures. 
The hardest thing for me is that how many shots he takes a day, how many pokes of needles he takes throughout the day, how many medicines, I mean, he takes every single day. There's a lot of poison going into his system, a lot of poison to kill this, this, the big C, what he calls it, the big C. At the suggestion of a friend, Husker volleyball legend Terry Pettit, Schmall writes a personal blog on his living with cancer. The name of the blog is The Last Train. I've always been into analogies. I love analogies, and I don't remember how and when it hit me, but, but that's kind of what hit me was, you know what, I'm on my last train ride, and I, I don't know exactly when the train is going to come to an end, but my ticket's been punched, and I know the destination, and now I'm on that ride. And, um, and my philosophy there was just, what can I do to make the most of this train ride? And the thing that I've really tried to do in my blog is just be honest. Um, not, I'm not trying to impress people. I'm not trying to be a heroic figure or, or anything like that. I'm just trying to honestly share my feelings, my thoughts on, on life and, and where I'm at right now. You know, when I started writing the blog, I thought if, if the only two people who read it are my wife and my son, that's enough. The first blog was very touching and it made me cry because I'm thinking, is he trying to tell me that this is it, that I'm done, that this is goodbye, that, you know, I'm, I'm on the last train, my stop is, is around the corner and I'm done. And I said, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that, that you're, I don't want to hear that you're dying or that you're thinking you're going to die tomorrow. And he says, and he says, well, that's reality. And I said, well, you know, you got to think of us and yourself that, you know, you're going to fight for this. She doesn't really want to think about death. She doesn't, when I write about the fact that I'm going to die, she doesn't like it. He wants to have his life celebrated, and I get it, and I think that that's awesome, celebrating your achievements and successes rather than just remember those last final moments because that's not what's important. It's important the times that you shared, not the morning that you shared in the very end. You know, It's the, t the thing that we have to force ourselves constantly to do is not look at, like, watch Dad get sick. It's, no, let's, let's cherish the moments that we have. Let's cherish his good days and go out and do fun things as our family so that we have memories. Those are the memories that I want to remember. I don't want to remember the times that he's sick. Want chocolate? Yeah. What's up with that? How about red velvet? Did you put a red velvet on there? Before Jeff's diagnosis, Jeff and Maria moved to New York to help with their son's new cookie business. Today, the Schmalls run a thriving cookie bakery in Manhattan called Schmackeries. This is Zach's maple bacon. Actually has pieces of bacon in it. And this is my favorite cookie, maple bacon. Because he's a junk food junkie. <laughs> and it's awesome. The store is, is literally blocks from Times Square. I mean, you're in the middle of it all. Marie and I are, are very adaptable and we had no doubt that this was where we should be and wanted to be and and it was fun it was exciting being part of a of a cookie store and it doing well i was thinking that with this that we and it's been fun just to watch zach grow as a business person and watch the business grow as well this much when he was originally diagnosed they said your dad has a year if he's lucky six months is is more likely and that hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, you know, my parents, are, we're, we're like partners. And, uh, and I don't mean business partners, we're, we're a team. Zach will come over maybe once a week and spend the night, and Maria will cook one of our favorite meals, and we'll just sit around and talk and just have a great time. And Maria will sometimes go to bed early, and Zach and I will stay up for a couple hours and just talk. I guess I'd like to know his true feelings about death you know, which terrifies me, but to, you know, if it ever got down to that point to be able to say like, dad, are you scared? You know, what are you feeling right now? Those are the things that, you know, I, I would want to know, but it's 
the answer is really hard. I hope the message that people get is that it's going to be okay. This ride that we're on called life is pretty special. If I had to come down to, to what is it that's the best medicine, it's to, to make sure you're feeding your soul, to make sure that you're doing things that you really, really enjoy to the, to the, just to the depths of your person and that you spend time doing those things. Pancreatic cancer is a difficult one. It's projected to be the mo second most deadliest cancer by 2030. The survival rate is not great. Dr. Uh, Thayer, you're an internationally recognized physician and scientist from Harvard Medical School, now at UNMC, and your specialty is pancreatic uh, cancer. So I'll start with you. We seem to be making progress against some other types of cancer. Mm -hmm. Why can't we make progress against pancreatic cancer? Well, the cancers that we're actually doing the best with have screening modalities, and we also have a pretty good understanding about what might be caused of them. For example, cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Pancreatic cancer is very difficult because we really don't have a great understanding or big drivers that may be causing the formation of this cancer. That's the first thing. The second thing is we really have no screening mechanism for this type of cancer because it's a fairly rare cancer. And so screening the entire population is uh, cost prohibitive. And even if we did, we really don't have very good screening modalities. So we're not even sure that even if we could identify them, if we could identify them early enough to have a meaningful outcome. The other thing is that symptoms can't really drive its presentation. It's a very quiet cancer until the cancer is at an advanced stage where there's very little hopes for cure and often meaningful palliation. And when we talk about some of the symptoms that it can have, you know, such as uh, what Jeff talked about, you know, a little bit of side pain, a little bit of back pain, maybe he had a little bit of pain after he ate, all these are so nonspecific and really direct themselves to more common diagnoses that most people don't think of pancreatic cancer. The combination of all these kind of results in it presenting at an advanced stage. So when it comes to the research that's being done for pancreatic cancer, what are the positives that you can pull out right now? Well, first of all, we are making progress in pancreatic cancer. And I think the nation as a whole understands the importance of research and how research and the information that we're getting is the hope in this disease. So the NIH has increased funding for pancreatic cancer, and there are big groups of people that are looking at the genetics, looking at the tumor microenvironment, and all the important things that might be contributing to this. The key things that we are trying to identify very early on is early biomarkers. Is there something that we can identify that might let us know that the cancer is there before we can detect it by another imaging? So ultimately, a lot of people are focused on identifying pancreatic cancer early by per perhaps a biomarker. The other thing that I think that um, is really going on and really important is that for a long time, pancreatic cancer was very difficult to study because we didn't have access to tissue. So it became very difficult to, to basically identify the genomic mutations that went on that drove the formation of this cancer and are important in the biology of this cancer. So over the course of the last decade, there has been an increasing emphasis to try to get tissue so that we can study this cancer better. We can identify the genes that might be mutated, that might be creating this, this bad biology. And the goal is to identify those genes that are driving the behavior of this tumor so we can basically attack that tumor at those nodal points, at those particular mutations, and hope to give our patients in the future a directed treatment that really affects their tumor without really affecting them. I'll just add that we have actually um, some of the strongest programs in pancreatic cancer research in the nation here in Nebraska. So Dr. Tony Hollingsworth and Surinder Batra have led a team here for the last uh, 20 years. They have four of the largest grants from the National Cancer Institute looking at early detection of, uh, of pancreatic cancer. Uh, they're a National Cancer Institute biomarker discovery lab. Mm -hmm. We've also had a special program of research excellence funded for 15 years now directly de developing new therapies for pancreatic cancer. So it's a, it's a program that really started back here in the 70s with the development of the first animal model for mm -hmm. pancreatic cancer, which there was no models for that. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's really a, a real strength in, in Nebraska um, to, to have this research team. That's together. great to hear about that, that hope. And 
and th that is good news. Our next story features another Husker legend, Jack Hoffman. Jack put a national focus on pediatric brain cancer. Today, cancer trials and therapies are presenting new hope for Team Jack. Seven-year-old Jack Hoffman, again, the pediatric cancer patient. It was a touchdown run during the 2013 Husker Spring game that most of us learned the plight of then seven-year-old Jack Hoffman. Jack Hoffman to the end zone, Husker touchdown. Diagnosed with pediatric brain cancer the year before, Jack made his run while undergoing chemotherapy. He just became the leading rusher for the spring game. For a short time, his cancer was stabilized, but last fall the tumor began to grow, and that's when Jack enrolled in a groundbreaking clinical trial. Jack is on a clinical trial that uh, was a discovery we made back in 2009 of a new mutation that occurs in his kind of tumor. And we've now treated about 30 kids. Jack is one of them. So when you have an opportunity to engage in a clinical trial and, and, and participate by you know, taking a drug that is new and it's fresh, it, it, can, it can be the difference between life or death for kids. Jack has a genetic mutation in his tumor. Genetic mutations are an oncogene which serves as the gas pedal for a brain tumor. I always tell people, if you have a bad tree in the forest and you want to get rid of the tree, chemotherapy just starts a forest fire. Jack is on a kind of treatment where we've got a bad tree in the forest and we're going to go after it with a chainsaw. Jack receives monthly treatments in Boston. And results of the groundbreaking drug he's taking are promising, as it's shown to either stabilize or shrink brain tumors. The problem is that we're not sure if the ones that stopped growing are now stopped for good and are dead, but the scar or whatever is still there or whether there's still some live cells there, because obviously the only way you could answer that would be to do a big operation. So the other thing that we're going to look at that unfortunately will take more time is once you've completed the drug, does the tumor say stop forever, or at some time will it grow again and you need to be retreated? So we don't have all of the answers yet, but in terms of the ability to shrink or stop growing, the vast majority of these tumors, somewhere in the 90% range is astronomical for anything we've been done particularly for a genetic abnormality that was only discovered six years ago. That's the thing about a clinical trial. They're trials. We don't have a proven set of data. It's kind of like rolling the dice. But when you're a child with a brain tumor, you have to roll the dice. So Jack's dad, and I guess his official spokesman, Andy Hoffman, <laughs> joins us on set now. Thanks, Andy. Jack is in the clinical trial in Boston, as we just heard. Tell us how he's doing. You know, clinically, Jack is doing super. He's on a targeted drug therapy, which focuses in on an oncogene. Uh, and so that's really the blessing of all of this is that you would know he's even undergoing cancer therapy. He takes the, the drug twice a day, and he's got to do a lot of travel going back to Boston and things like that. But clinically, he's, he's doing great. And, you know, the thing that, um, you know, to me, what the story that, that Jack tells is really the importance for funding pediatric brain cancer research. This clinical trial is available to him because someone six, seven years ago said, hey, let's invest in pediatric brain cancer research. As a result, they found a genetic abnormality, and then today they're able to match that abnormality up with a drug that was approved for adult cancer therapy, but that doesn't happen without research funding. And when it comes to the clinical trials, we heard you say it, they're, they're kind of like rolling the dice, but you have to roll the dice in this situation. So what went into the decision for your family about deciding to participate in the clinical trial? Well, it's a big decision. Uh, you know, the thing about cancer therapies with kids, pediatrics, you know, there's 13,000 children a year diagnosed with any form of pediatric cancer, 4,000 kids diagnosed with pediatric brain cancer with such a lack of funding for the disease, with less than 4% of the federal dollars being invested in pediatric cancer research, uh, you really don't have a lot of options because that's all that's available. With one new drug approved by the FDA in the last 25 years for kids with cancer, clinical trial, that's our only access to new therapies. That's kids' only access to new therapies is through clinical trials. Unfortunately, a lot of times kids go through these clinical trials and then those drugs aren't don't make it all the way through the phase one, the phase two, the phase three, to where they're finally approved for long-term use for kids. And so kids are at an inherent disadvantage when it comes to fighting cancer because of the gross lack of funding in this country. 
Now, the clinical trial Jack is in, as we mentioned, is on the East Coast. Talk to us about the stress on Jack and on your family having to go through that. You've got the travel, the missing school, the separation. You know, it's uh, that that piece of it is is there. Um, it, Jack's not special. So many kids diagnosed with brain cancer or any form of childhood cancer, they have to travel. Kind of the 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 uh, the joke amongst a lot of the brain tumor parents is have brain tumor will travel. This clinical trial is only available at 15 clinical trial sites throughout the United States. There is no trial site between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains, and so you're going to have to get on a on a plane if you want your son to be able to participate in this targeted drug therapy. So there really isn't an option. There is no choice and so you just put your boots on and you kind of take that Nebraska, you know, attitude and you just you go to work and you do what needs to be done to beat this thing because that's there's just no other option. Dr. Thayer and Cowan, I think we had talked previously and you said Nebraskans aren't always eager to participate in clinical trials. Why is that and why should they be? So, so I'll go back first of all to the concept of how important clinical trials are to move the field uh, along. It turns out while funding for research in pediatric cancer is very underfunded, over the years since so few children got cancers, researchers and clinicians around the country tended to put as many pediatric patients on clinical trials as possible. So if you look at the improvements in survival of patients with pediatric cancers, particularly in leukemia and some of the solid tumors, mm -hmm. brain tumors are, are, are totally different. There's been more improvement in pediatric cancer because almost 90% of pediatric cancer patients were enrolled in trials over the years, whereas less than 5% of adult patients get enrolled in clinical trials. You can't improve the therapy if you can't prove that it's more effective, and you can only prove it through clinical trials. So we need more adult patients going on clinical trials, and we need more research in both adult and pediatric, particularly in pediatric, because pediatric cancers are different than adult cancers. You can't take the research being done, even at the genomic level, in adult cancers and apply it to pediatric cancers. So we really do need more funding for research, and we need to have more patients enrolled in clinical trials. Andy, what do you want the public to know about raising a child with cancer? Never lose hope. If you have a child stricken with this disease, fight like mad. You know, we are so incredibly inspired as a family uh, to know so many other pediatric cancer families throughout the state of Nebraska and really throughout the country. If, you were, if that day ever comes, don't ever give up and go as hard and as fast as you can. And I think the real message here is that we as a society should be embarrassed by the lack of funding that our private drug companies are investing in pediatric cancer research, that our federal government is not spending on pediatric cancer research, less than 4%, I think I said earlier, of all federal dollars spent on cancer research are spent on kids. That's an embarrassment to our country and that needs to change. And this disease needs to be put on the national agenda. It needs to be talked about in presidential debates. It needs to be talked about in the halls of Congress. And it really takes everybody getting excited about this disease as not just pediatric brain cancer, all childhood cancers, because that we all we're all in this together, and we all need major support from from these institutions. You and your family had a negative, and you decided to turn it into a positive. So you, along with others, started the Team Jack Foundation. Now, about three years later, you've raised more than two million dollars for pediatric brain cancer research. Are you already making an impact with that money? One of the exciting things that we've been able to do with that money is to team up with two other private nonprofit foundations and help fund a clinical trial. It's a, a clinical trial um, that is just getting ready to enroll patients and uh, right here in the United States and it's, it's exciting because this is a new therapy that kids with brain tumors are going to have available to them that wouldn't otherwise be available to them without the Team Jack Foundation and without the support of Nebraskans. So that's direct impact, that's real impact. We've got some amazing other uh, things that we're, we're able to do with the money uh, that we're excited about. We've got some other things in the work, works uh, as well. So there's a lot of things that can be done and what we're trying to do is, is just make as much impact as we can with the dollars that we raise. And you were telling me earlier that you are very proud of Nebraska for the role it's taken. Nebraska is amazing. I think Nebraska is a leader when it comes to supporting pediatric cancer research, not just at the state legislative level, but at the community level and at the Husker fan level. Uh, you know, <laughs> Team Jack isn't the only, only foundation out there trying to raise money and, and for research and do things. And this state has just wrapped their arms around this entire disease state, and we couldn't be more thankful for that.
I'll just applaud the Hoffman family and Team Jack because not, it's not only about raising money, which they've been very good at uh, trying to do, but raising awareness is so important and they've been so instrumental in raising awareness across the state and across the country about the importance of funding research in pediatric cancer. You got a great attitude. Andy, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having us. All right. Well, for many cancer patients and cancer survivors, keeping a healthy attitude can be the best medicine. I was diagnosed with breast cancer on March 27th, nine years ago. I was totally devastated. And my mom said, Cheryl, this is gonna be bigger than you. And she's right. Cheryl's friends rallied in an effort to raise her spirit. It was my third treatment, so I had lost my hair. My friends threw me a hat shower. And that's when the creativity started. I had a Viking cap. My girlfriend drove me. We had to open the, the roof of her car, sunroof, so you know we could put the horns out. It just started like, oh my God, this is fun. And then walking into the cancer center, the, the stairs that you got, and it's like, oh my God, she's crazy. For Cheryl, the funny hats turned into costumes and bringing baked goods for other patients. She used all of this as a distraction from the cancer treatment. It was a godsend for me. And, you know, going through the treatment, you know, you really felt ill and tired and sick and tired of being sick and tired. It was easier to focus on what outfit to wear, what cookies to bake. It gave me the energy to get to the next appointment. Patients who take a proactive part in, in fighting their cancer, take a can-do attitude. If you start at the bottom of a mountain and you say, there's no way I'm gonna get to the top of that, then you're probably not going to. But if you start at the bottom of that mountain and say, I'm gonna get to the top of that mountain, you've got a better chance than, than the other person. Well, are we too old for this? <laughs> After beating her cancer, Cheryl decided to continue bringing smiles and positive energy to other patients. Yeah. Do you need some more too? Friends, family, and fellow survivors joined Cheryl's flock, which was named after one of the first hats that she wore. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm so happy to see you. I know it. I know it. We are Flamingos for Hope. The acronym is Flamingos, but it's friends laughing, achieving miracles, inspiring and nurturing gifts, offering smiles. I have seen big changes. When we come through the cancer center, um, it's usually a quiet, calm place. And then, um, you know, we arrive and people are starting to talk to each other. And I just see a, a totally different um, atmosphere once we've come through. It's, it's just really Really cool how it's grown. Okay. And did you get kisses today? Yes, yes. I did. Mm -hmm. All right, because it's a special day. It's kind of magical. Well, we want to welcome Dr. Renesa Anthony, who joins us now. Dr. Anthony is uh, from the UNMC Department of Health Promotion and Social and Behavioral Health. Thank you so much, Dr. Anthony, for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. I want to talk a little bit about health disparities. Um, when we talk about breast cancer, African-American women in Nebraska have about the same rate of incident, but yet more African-American women are dying at a higher rate than Caucasian women. Uh, let's start off by talking about why is that? Well, first of all, I commend you for even having health disparities as a part of this discussion because it's so important. Uh, what we know in the data is that if you do the numbers and you do the math, breast cancer diagnosis for African-American women can actually be a death sentence. And we think that's for a couple of reasons. Some of those are social determinants of what we call social determinants of health from a public health perspective. And that, so is it that African-American women may be less likely to have insurance and therefore less likely to have prevention in terms of the screening that's really important, so mammograms? Are there cultural differences? Um, and in Nebraska, some of the data points to for some women that is the case. But what we also know is that there are some genetic differences as well. So when African-American women, and even women of color, so Hispanic women as well, uh, when they're diagnosed with breast cancer, we're finding that they are what we call triple negative, meaning that their receptors for estrogen, progesterone, and something called HER2-NU 
are negative, and those are really important for some of the medications that we have that we treat cancer with. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about clinical trials, and we found that out through some of the clinical trials um, in which we had more Caucasian women who were enrolled and less African American women. And we were able to find some very life-saving medications that when we gave them to Caucasian women, they did quite well. And when we gave them to African American women, they were dying. And what we found out was, well, wait a minute, they don't have the receptors that this medication is working on. And so then they had to start over with African-American women and looking at maybe some different types of modalities that would be helpful. Um, but as we talk about disparities, I want to emphasize that breast cancer, um, even though men can be impacted by breast cancer as well, that it's, it's gender specific for the most part, and that women of all races um, mm -hmm. are diagnosed with breast cancer. And as you age, that is your greatest risk factor. So let's talk about prevention then. Obviously, you look towards mammograms, and some of the studies show that uh, racial and ethnic minority groups uh, have fewer mammograms, more time between the mammograms, and don't act as quickly when something suspicious comes up on the mammogram. But in general, how often should women be getting mammograms, and when should they start? That's a great question, and we are at a debate in this country about when they should start. Um, at my clinic, we start screening at age 40. Um, most breast surgeons, people who do this work and understand this work, recommend that at age 40 you should get your first mammogram. And so I tell my patients in community-based education that we do is for your 40th birthday, you should have a celebration and you should be going to get your mammogram. Um, there are other thoughts where in some of the literature you will see that they're recommending at age 50. I tell women that they should be partnering with their physician talking to their physician, and based on that relationship, making that decision. But where I work, we start at age 40. Uh, in the state of Nebraska, we have a program called Every Woman Matters, where they will cover women who may not be able to afford or think they can't afford to get mammograms, and they start at age 40. So if Nebraska says 40, then we should all be saying 40. <laughs> wow. And access to care isn't just an issue for minorities, but uh, we live in a very large state, so um, if you live in the rural part of Nebraska, you may also have an issue with access to care in particular. So does where someone live in Nebraska, do you think that impacts their chance of survival? Where someone lives, where someone works, where someone plays, and where someone prays impacts their survival. Um, I'm very lucky to be in Omaha. If you were to talk about something like even accidents, if I get in an accident on Dodge Street, my ability to get to a tertiary care center and to a neurosurgeon is most likely to save my life. Compared to, I just drove to Kearney, um, if I went even further and I got in a massive accident, the likelihood of me getting to a neurosurgeon who could save my life, the difference in the timing changes. And that's the same with breast cancer. Um, women, in general, we're always taking care of other people. A lot of times, our own needs are last on that list. And so it takes time to actually schedule that appointment, to go in and find a place that has mammography services, to go in and get the test, to go back or even talk to someone to find out what those results are. And at a lot of times, I think what happens is that women put it on the back burner and it's so important for them to get in. But if you live in a place and you have to drive 90 minutes or 60 minutes, you may be less likely to actually take that initiative to get screened. And that screening is so important. Absolutely, it is. Well, thank you. Uh, in Nebraska, rural patients need to go to great lengths for cancer treatment, as we just talked about. Tracy Detlefs traveled thousands of miles from her home in Loop City to get treatment for breast cancer. She's also taken the extra step of enrolling in a breast cancer genetic registry being used by researchers at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. When you get to the radiation, you're driving every single day to have radiation treatment that may only last for five minutes. We were driving an hour one way. Fatigue kind of plays a part towards the end that makes it really difficult when you're this far away. It must have been exhausting. It was, very much. Naps are a good thing. See ya. Tracy Detlefs already led a busy life before she was diagnosed with stage one breast cancer in 2014. Besides working three nursing jobs and looking after seven children and stepchildren, Detlef sent her husband, Sean, raise Angus cattle in the heart of cattle country in Loop City, Nebraska. We work our full hours and then come home about six o'clock at night or so. And we've usually got some livestock to take care of, so sometimes we're out here chasing cows in the dark. 
Fighting cancer in rural Nebraska means spending a lot of time in the car. Detlefs estimates she's covered 10,000 miles in the last year. That includes trips to Lincoln, 140 miles away for surgery. Then there were countless trips to Grand Island and Kearney for chemotherapy and radiation. That much time on the road lets the mind wander. There's always concern. Will you see your children grow? Um, will you get to witness all those milestones in a family's life? But we're very positive that whatever's meant to be will be. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Chopur is an amazing man, but I feel really encouraged to have him as my physician. Dr. Sikha Chopur is based at St. Francis Medical Center in Grand Island, but also goes to cancer clinics like this one in Hastings, where his first patient of the day came from Kansas for a checkup. Majority of our patients, cancer patients, live in rural setting, and and with that, having some uh, tumor registry and collaborative work is crucial. Patients from 23 hospitals across the region are donating blood and tumor samples to create a breast cancer genetic registry. Researchers can compare DNA from different patients in the database to reveal genetic patterns. We'd like to be able to say that a given genetic signature or profile will give us more information than the standard microscopic exam that we've used in the last 200 years. But that takes lots and lots and lots and lots of information. To That's where patients like Tracy Detlefs come in. Being a nurse, I'm up for anything that involves more research or data gathering. And so when they approached me about it, I was really open to being part of that. There are now more than 2,000 patients in the breast cancer registry. Researchers are already sorting through the data. But as more patients are added, it will be easier to see genetic patterns that could advance cancer treatment. Hi. Hi. Well, that's real encouraging that if something bad is gonna happen, something good can come out of it. The good news for Tracy is that her prognosis is good. Her cancer was caught early. She's finished treatment with Dr. Shopur, and it looks like it's working. Love to see a healthy baby on the ground. But she says it's also empowering to know that after her cancer is gone, her genetic information could help cure patients in the future. The greatest hope out of all of this would be to see a world cancer-free in the next generation for our children. You know, you hear of all the kids in St. Jude's, and we've got all the people in our local community that are adults that have cancer, and it'd be wonderful if we could figure out a way to beat this or eradicate it so that we didn't lose so many people. Dr. Thayer, why is it important for a registry like this to bring in more data from rural areas? What does that add to the research? I think it adds a broader patient sample as well. I think that if you stay in a tiny area, the exposures that a patient may have are very common to a city. Um, it may not be applicable to a rural environment. So I think having a good pool of patients with their different tumor types can contribute to the data. I think having too much of one may not be applicable to the other. So I think in order to have the widest possible net, you need to have the widest possible patient population. And Dr. Cowan, is genome therapy a game changer? So um, that's where the future is for all cancer diseases. But I'll go back to the registry in terms of it's more than just a genetic study. It actually is a uh, uh, a database of all the patients that we can uh, enroll with breast cancer. Uh, across Nebraska, and actually uh, uh, there's, there are um, uh, patients in uh, the Great Plains in North and South Dakota, and actually across this, the country have actually uh, taken on our registry as part of their uh, projects. It enrolls a lot of patient information about their family history, their um, past medical history, the medicines they've been on. It, it tells us something about their um, exposures to different things, whether it's what, what sort of lifestyle they live, uh, their diet, their exercise, um, their smoking uh, uh, habits, their, their um, weight over different time periods, and, and again, what sort of activities they're exposed to. Do they live in rural Nebraska and are they farmers or ranchers? Do they live in urban uh, areas? So we have a br very broad cohort of, uh, of patients in this. They also agree to give us their tissues, uh, both blood samples as well as their tumor tissues uh, that we can then do genomic studies on. We use the blood to look at uh, markers to see who's really at risk for breast cancer. There are two genes that we know of 
breast cancer 1, breast cancer 2, BRCA1, BRCA2 that were discovered in the late 90s and, uh, and early 2000s, um, some of which were actually done uh, right here in Nebraska with Dr. Henry Lynch contributing a lot of samples uh, to Mary Claire King who did the research. But there are other genes that also can, at some uh, mutation in, in a family, lead to an increased risk and we're looking at some of those uh, factors. But then looking at the cancer genome, we can actually look at the genomic changes in the cancer cells. And as Dr. Thayer pointed out, it tells us something not only about what drives the cancer and what new therapies that target those specific mutations we might use to treat these patients with. Again, we're trying to use chemotherapy standard, but the future is to these targeted therapies. And so if we can have the, uh, a database of the genomic changes and, and make sure that patients are eligible for clinical trials using these new therapies, it also tells us something about does the exposure lead to a different way of getting these mutations? Do different exposures lead to different changes that tell us something about their risk? We'll then be able to screen patients much more effectively. We'll be able to treat patients much more effectively. I'd have to say that uh, breast cancer and the research that's gone behind breast cancer, because we have thousands of women and thousands of studies, breast cancer is actually a model cancer. It is taking what was, yest uh, what was yesterday's research is today's reality. So we use molecular subtyping to identify those women with very difficult cancers versus those cancers that are easily controllable. So Dr. Anthony mentioned ERPR. Well, we know that if these tumor cells express them, we can regulate them through blocking those receptors. And we know if they express a powerful oncogene that we call HER2, that we have chemotherapies directed specifically at that oncogene. So you can see that the tailored treatments and careful subtyping and putting patients into effective treatments is a reality for breasts. We're just expanding that reality to see how much more we can understand about this tumor. But breast is a wonderful model of what will come for other cancers in the future. Dr. Anthony, are we seeing more Nebraskans take advantage of screenings? I think that Nebraska, <clears throat> excuse me, that when it comes to women-specific screening, and we're talking about breast cancer right now, but another cancer, cervical cancer, that gets ignored, those two cancers are, I believe, models as well. We have great screening tests for them and we have great treatments for them. What I think is one of the, the barriers is education. Mm -hmm. And so in our center and at UNMC, we're really committed to community engaged education and getting out and what we happen to know because we've spent, oh my gosh, they spent tons of years <laughs> in school and, and we practice and we learn these things and we're constantly up to date on what's going on, but the average human being may not know. And so what we're doing at UNMC is we're getting out and not just in Omaha, but across the state and spreading the message of what can you do to prevent these diseases once you have uh, cancer, what, what you do to screen for them, what the best treatments are for them. And uh, when it comes to breast and cervical cancer, I think that uh, getting people out and getting them screened is really important. And our state has a program, I talked a little bit about Every Woman Matters, and it covers not just mammograms for women 40 plus, but it also covers those pap tests as well. I'll just go on and say that cervical cancer is a great model also for mm -hmm. prevention of a cancer. Correct. This is a disease we know a lot about the etiology now in terms of virus and there are vaccines that actually can prevent that viral infection and can prevent cervical cancer in our lifetime. So if we have active public policies about not only screening but vaccination, we can prevent this disease and eradicate it. Dr. Thayer, what, what excites you the most about the research that's going on right now? I think basically the key thing is the more we understand about a cancer, the, like, the higher the likelihood that we'll have an effective treatment and we'll be able to cure that cancer. So that really is the thing that holds all of us in research, especially those of us who deal with very deadly cancers. I don't think any of us could do it if we thought we were going to offer the same treatment today as we would tomorrow. So the real exciting part about research is changing the future for our patients and it's really going to become a reality. We talked early on about the importance of research in the laboratory mm -hmm. and research in the clinic and care of patients in the clinic. But today it's actually about building the whole team, really getting a team together to approach the cancer patient from the bench to the bedside. Understanding how you move these discoveries from the laboratory into the clinic as quickly as possible for the benefit of patients. We've also learned that in the past we 
had silos of patients. Some of us would treat breast cancer, some of us would treat pancreatic cancer, some of us would treat cervical cancer. Well now with the genomic approach we understand that every single cancer is different and some breast cancers are more like lung cancer at the genetic level than they are like other breast cancers. So we should actually form these teams bigger and have a genomic approach looking at what drives a cancer uh, and try to use the um, models that we look at in some diseases to try that in other diseases using the genomic approach uh, to understanding. And, we, and that's the future in terms of the excitement of where research is leading to new uh, therapies. No, knowing what's going on with research, with prevention, with screenings, are you optimistic about the future of uh, battling cancer in Nebraska? Absolutely. Um, in addition to what we've been talking about, we've left out technology. I mean, mm -hmm. with, with apps, with telemedicine, where we're going in the 21st century with cancer screening, diagnosis, and treatment. Um, I'm just excited to see where we are and to be at UNMC in Nebraska and the outstanding research that's being done from, as Dr. Collins said, from the bench to the bedside and then also taking that message from the bedside to the outside in the community. I'm just very optimistic. I would say that Nebraska can actually lead the world. We, we actually have such a close-knit community across the state. The Cancer Center through the registry has been building these relationships with hospitals across the state to work with cancer patients in their local hospitals and to understand what's, what's, uh, what we can do to help raise the standard of care across the entire state. We have, uh, as was highlighted in, in one of the videos, again, the cattle industry, we've had a relationship with the Cattlemen's Ball in Nebraska to raise awareness about cancer research, the importance of cancer research across the entire state. So we actually have an opportunity with a state of this size population to actually understand the entire uh, mechanism of cancer across the state and, and work together to make sure that every single patient has the best care possible. Well, Dr. Cowan, Dr. Thayer, Dr. Anthony, thank you all for coming in tonight. I'd also like to thank Andy Hoffman for his time as well. Our guests, our guests traveled here to discuss a topic that uh, many people generally try to avoid, and I thank them for doing that. And for those living with cancer, thank you for sharing your personal and powerful stories. Keep doing that. For more information, you can visit our website at netnebraska.org cancer. Thank you for watching.